he got the helmets of soldiers who were lamb. The United States periodically invades little islands. So they said, next time we invade a little island, they put little cameras and recorders. They do. Man. That's what they use. Little cameras and recorders in the soldiers' helmets. Beautifully little micro engineer things. And show what happens when the soldiers leave a ship and they're in the water and they're invading an island. And it was astounding. You'd see a man walking on the beach with a machine gun. And you don't know, is he an enemy? Is he a friend? Did you shoot them? And they then showed these to the future officers. And it had nothing to do with boxes or anything. You'd see these young guys, you know, being led, holy shit, who is that? Should we shoot, you know, cursing, dying, death. it's chaos. That's what war is like. Reads Tolstoy, talks about that war and peace. And then you show that to these future officers. This is what it's like. What do you do? How do you act quickly? How do you act? respond immediately? You get the wrong person, you finish, blow you down, get the, you know, the right person. I mean, it's chaos. How do you act in chaos, the chaos of war? It changed the entire way of how they taught in West Point. What's more, they set up a whole system called the Center for Army's Lessons Learned, where they store these things and show them to people. This is what it's like. They interview people. You were at this battle, tell us what it was like. And don't start using abstract words. Tell us what it was like. They call this ground truth, the truth of the soldier on the ground. Ground truth is absolutely absent from many of our analytical studies. It really is. You don't need. I remember taking the myself taking a class in economics, a subject I was actually a little bit interested in until I took a class in mathematics, which I wasn't any good at it. And I took, it had nothing to do with buying and selling things. I had relatives in business, you know, small stores in Brooklyn selling and buying. But what does this have to do with anyone's life? Nothing. They couldn't explain the, the Great Depression. Nothing at all. Maybe they should have had lessons learned. The last point I wanted to make, which is really important about in this area, is again, this was said by Erasmus, again, 16, the Erasmus, not the history, but the Erasmus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Every time I say these things, yeah. said, what you know is determined on where you stand. This is true for all of us. This is what the leaf was getting at early. You may think you're objective. You may think, I believe in a higher truth. I study things. And you, we all strive to do that. But who you are, how you act, and what you know is strongly influenced on where you stand. You stand here, you stand there. You believe this, you believe that. When I talk about the social web, <coughs> that we're all born into. The social stew, the social ocean, whatever words you'd like to use, strongly influences who you are and what you believe. Now, it doesn't mean we're doomed, we're destined. It's not. I wouldn't believe that at all. We all can change. We all can, people born into one tribe can learn about other tribes. One of the great things we see in the world today, really, I'm a living example of this, I'm children is, People from tribes marrying each other. People from tribes. I, mean, I was a boy. I, I, there, were, there was a boy I knew in the next street who was uh, Irish. And he fell in love with a girl who went to the same church as him, who was Italian. Oh, their, their relatives were wild. And I asked my own mother, I said, but they're both Catholic. What possible objections? They go to the same church, St. Luke's. I mean, they go to the same church. Just, you'll understand when you're older. <laughs> the answer I was constantly given, which made, was absolutely worthless to me. But it's true that parents, they really raised hell. They didn't go to the wedding and all, mm -hmm. and they were both have That sort of stuff is gone. I, at least it's gone, I think, in the United States. We walk, up, Brendan and I walk around, you know, a lot of places, and you see all sorts of people together. We know we're not from the same tribe, which is wonderful. So it doesn't mean you're destined to be born in one tribe to obey all the dictates of the tribe, but it's in ways that are very subtle. What you know is still strongly determined on where you stand, who you talk to. One of the, I just read that 96% of the people in Congress are millionaires. Ooh. Some are billionaires. 96%. I couldn't believe it. I don't think all Congress. Yeah. Never made it. I think you own a house. 
in some places you become a millionaire just by owning a house in certain areas. Uh, but that's a tremendous number. Of course, even with the greatest goodwill, now there were, and Franklin Roosevelt, really, <coughs> Eleanor Roosevelt, probably more likely, really cared about the plight of poor people, and she was very wealthy. Uh, Ted Kennedy, I mentioned earlier, at least later in life, really seemed to care about the plight of people who were poor, and he was very wealthy. So it's not, these aren't deterministic factors, but they're sure influential, if that's the way to bet on. So again, less, less than I would say. Holding on to hate, holding on to these things, yeah. it's really an important. Once again, I'll tell you one more story. Again, I like telling stories, not so much I like talking about myself, I don't do it, but because it grounds stuff. So Brenda and I, I got one of these speaking gigs, which I periodically get in Maui, this great thing. Come to Maui, give a talk, you can bring your family. That's right, here today, gone to Maui. <laughs> It was really a good deal. So there were all sorts of professors from around the world. It's called Hicks, the Hawaii International something. Like so one, I'm giving this talk. It was fine. I was talking to a lot of the other the professors about these subjects. And I'm sitting there one time, and the man comes up to me, having a nice cup of coffee, beautiful weather. And he's from one of the, big, the biggest universities in, um, in Serbia. He spoke English pretty well. So we're talking about you know, real subjects. And a man walks by, and suddenly this guy, he, his whole physiognomy changed, and he looks at, you see that man over there? Yeah, he's one of the uh, participants. He's a crow. <laughs> yes, so what? Do you understand what they did to us? And I'm trying to think, what, did I miss a war? What are you doing? <laughs> this is before the whole Serbian crisis. What are you telling me? 1377, <laughs> <laughs> some <laughs> they slaughtered our people. And this guy changed into a completely different person from an amiable professor to a man who looked like he, if he could, he would shoot that other guy dead. Oh my God. I said, that was 600 years ago. He's still, I mean, give it up. But he, 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 couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't give it up. Now, I can talk about that because, oh yeah, those are Serbs and Croats. Israelis and Palestinians, the English and the Irish, you don't need people in this country tribalism. You don't need to hold up. I'm just giving that as an example because it happened to me. But I've heard, I was in Israel and one time, I didn't want to get into any discussions about this stuff, but one time, a little bit I did, some, again, someone on the lobby, he said, God gave us this lamb. And I wanted to say, where's the deed? <laughs> the people, this goes on all the time, one of certainly a road to wisdom would be give that stuff up give up these tribal legends that are so strong in us. Stories, memes, you know, we enact stories. We live and die by stories. And these stories, you get you're born with them. You hear stories from your grandparents, from other people you grow up with. There's an interesting word called meme, M-E-M-E, -E, which I'm sort of interested in. Uh, Richard Dawkins invented, developed this word. It's sort of the psychological equivalent of a gene. So with Gene, you know, your father's bored, you become bored, Gene comes down to that. Memes are sort of actionable items, little stories, little lessons that float around and you pick them up and they become part of you. They become part of you. It's a very interesting concept. It's not so scientific as Dawkins would have imagined, but it's a true thing. We all, little heuristics, little rules, rules of acting. And we get them, and they're hard as hell to eradicate. It's really difficult for all of us. All, I mean, this is no, but I think one of the, um, if I had a pick, so we tried this experiment in this class at Jiu-Jitsu. If I couldn't use the word wisdom, what word would I use? If somehow the word was banned, you couldn't use the word, what's the equivalent word for wisdom? It's really difficult, we all have to think about that. One would be reflection. You mentioned this, I think that you can't be wise without reflection, without thinking, well, I believe this. Is this true? Is this help anyone? Is this any good holding on to hatred, holding on to stories you're told about other people, <coughs> holding on to all these deep ideological blinders that people have? We all have. And reflection is the way to offset that in terms of how to become more wise. So uh, we have 10 minutes left. You're going to speak again? Yeah. Yeah.
So once again, we're talking about <coughs> how do you develop wisdom? Is it talking about it, using it? But wise institutions, wise institutions, try to change things you can change. Try to talk about it. And if you're going to change, it's 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 very easy to get discovered. Well, how am I going to change Washington? How am I going to change, you know, the state I live in or the universities I go to? All of us can get so the universe or the world. I mean, it's so frustrated, just give up, which is an easy thing to do. And you just retreat into quietude or retreat into your own. It's, it's easy. It's hard to, you know, I think that happens throughout history. But one of the things, you can try to change how people, how people do things, where you live. I'll tell you about a great failure I had to do in this. In the high, town I live in, with the leap a few people in this room live in, Lexington. Lexington's full of engineers, consultants, and gra graduate uh, people who went to fancy graduate school. Yeah. Yeah. The whole town is full of these people. Lexington, Mass? Yeah. 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 Believe me, it's true. I know, I know. Right, you stand up more now. <laughs> so, they make, and this happened to me, they make all the students, every student, take calculus, right? So I had to do this myself in high school. I hated it, I couldn't, it gave me a migraine, I could barely do it. But my daughter, who's good at math, she could take, she had to take it, she could pass it. But I was thinking, well, how many people that will use calculus in their lifetime? Why do you make this required? And I began to try to find facts about this, and the nearest estimates of less than 0.005% will ever think about that subject for the rest of their life. So, why not make it an, an elective, not required, not give everyone migraines, or at least a fair amount of people, <laughs> and substitute for it rhetoric. Rhetoric. How to speak, how to frame an argument, how to think about things logically. A subject that was the heart of every college that existed in the year like 1600. Oxford, the Sorbonne, Bologna, rhetoric. Well, I mentioned this to someone we knew who was the, in the school board of Lexington. And she just looked at me as if I really as if I was crazy. <laughs> she said, but we'll never get ahead of you know, the Chinese or the Russians unless we teach calculus. Said, You're not going to get ahead of them that way. Trust me, it doesn't work that way. But no one believed me. And then she said, why don't you make a presentation to the school board? I don't think I can stand doing that. But I spoke to one or two of them about this. And again, gee, I thought, I, one of the guys actually said, he said, I thought you were very well educated yourself. <laughs> but it was like speaking Greek to a chicken. Honestly, absolutely no, absolutely no one has been doing that. People use rhetoric every day of their life. All of us do. Every day, you can't succeed. Another thing would be speaking um, extemporaneously. How do you talk on your feet? How do you think on your feet? Yeah. Which you use, mm -hmm. I mean, I would think literally every hour of your life or close to it. They would teach, and you could teach these things. These are skills. You could learn rhetoric. You could learn those things. They're much easier to teach than some other things. No, we have to teach calculus because otherwise our students will never be programmers. And one guy told me that, and I said, right. the Indians are smarter do it better than us and they're cheaper. There's no future in being a program. And once again, I was just laughed out. So you can try to do things, you can't always win, but you should try. That's again something, if you want to bring some wisdom into the world, don't, you don't have to aim at the very top. That's, that's you can try, but that's a whole other ball game. I mean, th th this is a question that I've often, you know, we, we, have, we have our presidents, we, we've had, uh, George Bush, and we've had Obama, and we now we have Trump. And when you listen to them speak, the to me, listening to them speak tells me whether they're wise, regardless of the subject matter. But for the most part, the culture doesn't seem to see it that way. They seem to think there is no connection between how you speak and how you think and the quality of your ideas. You're, I mean, right. you're absolutely right. No, I think that's a very, you know, it's interesting, I'll, again, a great study. This was, I read this in the Wall Street Journal a few years, about seven or eight years ago. 
the five smartest presidents of the 20th century, smart like IQ smart, every one of them was a failure. Jimmy Carter. Who are the others? No, no, he was not a failure. And he was smart. He was not a failure. Nixon. Nixon. Nixon graduated like at the top of the Duke Law School. Oh, I heard someone say it. Wilson. Hoover. Wilson and Hoover. Wilson was a real son of a bitch. A really bad man. He hated black. Deep dyed racist. Maybe the most racist president <laughs> we've had until recently. And Herbert Hoover graduated so number one, the first class of Stanford, graduated valedictorian, translated books from Latin into English. They all were failures. Failures as presidents. Mm -hmm. All of them. Nixon, Hoover. And if you bring it up today, you could add a few. Who were the most successful presidents? Truman, yeah. Franklin Roosevelt, C student all the way at Harvard. No one saw him ever reading a book. LBJ, perhaps. Reagan. Eisenhower, bottom of the class at West Point. They were all reasonably, some were very successful, but they were more successful than the people who, Wilson wrote 27 books with the president of Princeton University. It's very, very interesting when, to get what you're saying about who we pick for leaders, how do people rise up. I mean, you should think about that. Well, this should be the greatest president of all, then. He's the dumbest. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. Those guys have good hearts, I think. Only so good hearts. But he's not smart. See, he, too, he's not smart enough to reflect. I think I, Ronald Reagan, who I don't particularly care for, they found all these books, his own personal library, they were all annotated. Now, I would have thought he never read anything, but I was completely wrong about that. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower was another one. People made fun of him at the time and all. Hoover mentioned he, he wrote beautiful letters. Right? Oh, he yes. wrote beautifully as well as beautiful yeah, letters. Yeah, he was not who we thought he was. Yeah. I mean, the popular liberal jo George H.W. Bush is another one. I would say he was both smart and reasonably successful yeah. as a president. They certainly yeah. did. You know, President also there's a lot of tacitness what they're doing. You're not so much policy, but how they act, how they present themselves, how they raise their families. There's a lot of other, unfortunately, unfortunately, you put a lot of credence into that. I mean, I think reflection, I maybe mean, people like that, but it's an interesting, interesting thing to think about. Okay, I'm going to hand it back to the week. Thank you, Barry. On that great so he's going to be back. We hadn't planned on it, but he's going to be, uh, he's, he's going to have another uh, little session to sum up all the things, all his ideas. So we've added that to the program. So you'll you, you yeah. yeah. So he just made that change. Yeah. <coughs> so I think we're going to have a few notes. So, um, Larry mentioned uh, wise uh, people um, and and being grounded. Now, the story about that. Well, uh, uh, years ago, I used to be CEO of a small electronics company, uh, and uh, I don't know if you. Know, it's a high tech company, so I don't know if you know, but in high tech companies, the CEO is sort of the low man in the totem pole. <laughs> Everybody else <laughs> is on top. And they're all smarter than you. Everybody's, you know, has brains coming out of their pores. And uh, and so when I got there, I found that uh, nine months had gone by. We were spending millions of dollars a month, but there had been no sales. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a, so I decided to make myself a target. I said, look, um, I, my job is to make sure that we we sell something. So every morning, when I come in, I want you to ask me, Dilip, did you sell something today? So now this, they love doing, ribbing me every morning. Well, Dilip, did you sell something today? So this became a standing joke. And I, obviously, I was doing that so that everybody would focus that what we were really here for was uh, to, to sell something. So it so happened right at that time, I got the news that my mother was very, very sick. So I caught a plane, I went to Delhi, somehow I got on a plane to Calcutta, 
I go there and she's lying there uh, in her nursing home. 